very good afternoon to all the participants in this uh, second session of uh, the program wildlife conservation in india so in this program we are joined by honorable the chief justice welcome ma'am and we are joined by our resource person for today just one minute rajiv let me just let me introduce yes, yes ma'am uh kartik and uh, all my friends i apologize to you for this delay there was some misunderstanding i had told rajiv to start on time we were all here he is unnecessarily kept you waiting today for because he wanted me to speak sir a word and i didn't know that he is waiting for me so i was on mute and my video was not working but henceforth all sessions will start on time i apologize on behalf of the high court to all of you Now please, please don't worry Kartik. about it. Yes. We had a good no, conversation no, with Rajiv ji. No, but twenty minutes. Everybody, all the participants, all the attendees are waiting. It's not fair. No, no. We must be punctual, Rajiv. It's the first step. Don't do this Great. again. Next time, you please start the session on time. I'll if I'm not joined, I'll join midway. But sure. all sessions have to begin on time. All right, ma'am. Right, ma'am. Yes. So no, I'm so very sorry, ma'am. <laughs> Yes, sir. So, uh, welcome all the participants. Without taking much of time, I'll uh, request Mr. Karthik Satyanarayan to start the deliberations. Yes, sir, Karthik sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. And once again, it's a real honor to uh, be here on the second session of uh, the wildlife conservation discussion. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to do this. A, as requested by the honorable chief justice i have prepared a presentation that specifically addresses um the wildlife protection act of 1972 and the prevention of cruelty to animals act 1960 uh but at the right at right at the very beginning i'd like to please uh mention a caveat that i am not a lawyer so please forgive me if i uh um, you know do not use the right um language and the right terms but i am compiling 30 years of my field experience on the ground working with lawyers the police the forest department uh, in helping them to address um human wildlife conflict wildlife offenses and crimes against uh you know both wildlife protection and animal protection so without further ado i will launch my presentation and just go through the presentation if people who have asked questions on saturday are online uh, please just raise your hand and i'm sure shirina can uh, who's also with us on this uh, uh, webinar she will put those answers in we've already got your answers in place and if we have missed out any of your answers at the end of the presentation we will have a q and a session and we welcome you to ask any questions at all that you may have and i must also add that i am very fortunate that we have a wonderful team at wildlife sos who've helped me put this together um for especially for all of you uh, and it's curated for all of you and my colleague palak gupta um who is who's recovering from covid currently in punjab helped me by working on it all night and putting it together so i i certainly like to thank her for for her effort i am now launching the presentation i hope all of you can uh, view the slides on full screen yes it has come up sir yes thank you so this is of course day 2 so i've just used the same title uh, today um for the purpose of this presentation we will primarily discuss two issues and i'm going to uh, use anecdotal opportunities case studies and some real time references wherever possible to make the talk more interesting for all the attendees and i'm going to try and use some specific relevance to jammu and kashmir where uh, by the way the wildlife sos has been involved in for um, nearly uh, two decades now 
we've been fortunate enough to have a collaboration, an active collaboration and a partnership with the wildlife protection department over there. And we run two rescue centers, one for a bear orphanage in Dachigam and a bear rescue center in Pahalgaon. So I would invite all of you to also go there. Our uh, representative over there is Alia, who will be more than happy to show all of you. So moving on to the evolution of wildlife laws in India, uh, I'd like to just very briefly mention that, um, you know, as, as we've been led by the father of the nation, who himself said, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. So in a way, it also shows if we can be kind to animals and protective of, of animals, then we will be better people and we will be kind to each other. And I think there will be less crime overall. So I'd like to also um, highlight briefly, and I apologize for the bad photo, it's, a, it's slightly pixelated, I had to pinch it off the internet. But you know, India is a mixture of rich and very varied cultures. And different cultures show their affection towards animals in different ways. But during the British Raj is when a lot of importance was given to wildlife protection, but for the wrong reasons. They, uh, they believed in hunting, they had a big hunting uh, and game hunting, um, you know, entertainment uh, sport, and it was very popular. And to protect their wildlife for the purpose of shooting and hunting, they had forest blocks and they made laws around it to ensure that the local Indians could not uh, participate in that. That, unfortunately, as you can imagine, created a huge decline in numbers of protected wildlife. As you know, India is so rich in wildlife and biodiversity wealth. I think we're very, very fortunate that despite having only 3% of strong forest cover and protected areas, um, we still have a wealth of wildlife across India. You can see this photo here. It's an, it's an old photograph of two Britishers sitting amidst maybe about eight or 10 tiger skins leopard skins, there's ivory, everything imaginable is over there in the form of trophies. So in, in 1935 is when the British started paying attention to, you know, wildlife laws. But obviously in 1972 is when a very, very visionary act was put in place, the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. And I must say, I've interacted with various lawmakers around the world and people look at the Wildlife Protection Act, which is, uh, which is almost similar to the IRS in terms of you know, strictness and stringency. And they're very amazed how such a robust visionary law could be put in place in 1972. We also have in India, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, PCA 1960. Um, while it's, it's a good act, it uh, does not have some of the strong punishments, the penal clauses, and the opportunity to create deterrence, like the Wildlife Protection Act. So there is scope for improvement, and I hear that the government is considering revising and making amendments in that. So I'm going to move into the Wildlife Protection Act itself. The Wildlife Protection Act is primarily divided into um, five schedules. We have schedules of animals that are listed, and the animals listed in Schedule 1 and Part 2 of Schedule 2 receive the highest level of protection in our country. And that can be up to seven years imprisonment. It's a non-bailable, non-compoundable um, uh, offense. And the animals listed in this, uh, you know, as you can see, I've listed them. It's, it's a very long list, so I won't try to go through everything. But some of our bigger mammals and some of our rarer species are here, you know. Uh, including the Kashmir stag. Uh, in Schedule 2, Part 2 is where the Himalayan brown bear and the uh, Asiatic black bear, which, are, which is what you find in Kashmir. And they're very special species. They're not found in, uh, in any other part of India. They can only be found there. Um, sun bear, mouse, mouse deer, uh, pardon that typo, uh, pangolins, leopards, uh, sloth bears, fruit bats, rhinoceros, apologize for the typos, I can blame Palak for it. 
Uh, and again, part two, amphibians and reptiles. A lot of us think reptiles, snakes, monitor lizards don't get protection. They, some of them have the same level of protection as a tiger or an elephant. You know, crocodiles, look at this list over here on the left, you can see yellow monitor lizard, python, snakes, water monitor lizards, geckos, Indian shoft cell turtles, and then you have fishes like sharks. Um, I, I have myself been quite shocked when I, sometimes I would visit these fish markets just out of curiosity to see if any protected species are out there being sold. And I've always been shocked. There's never a time that I've come away relieved that the protected species are not on sale. It's happened almost every single time, including seahorses, which um, are highly protected, but unfortunately, the uh, they they are uh, captured and uh, illegally uh, used. Moving on to Schedule 1, Part 3, you have uh, several birds, and Kashmir is haven to birds, as you can imagine. You know, the, the waterfalls from across the world that receive protection in India as well migrate thousands of miles to come and, you know, give Kashmir an opportunity to host them. So they, you know, either feed or they nest or they lay eggs, take the chicks back, etc. Some of the birds are listed here. But unfortunately, they do not receive the protection uh, because there are poachers who, uh, who cheat them by putting decoy ducks in the water and, and shoot them. Uh, even butterflies and moths and insects, bugs, beetles, etc., receive protection under our Indian laws. So you can imagine how visionary uh, our lawmakers have been in the past. Moving on to Schedule 2, Part 2, uh, and again, this list is not comprehensive. We have just tried to put a few things in there to um, show you the kind of variety of species that are placed in these schedules. Please look for a copy of the Wildlife Protection Act, and uh, it would be good to have a copy of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and a copy of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. And uh, please add that to your library. These are special acts and will be very, very useful um, in, in, uh, in your careers in the future. Uh, I, and I'm saying this specifically to the law interns. Uh, rat snake, Himalayan brown bear, Asiatic black bear, jackal, red fox. These are all Schedule 2, Part 2. Again, these receive the same level of protection as the animals of Schedule 1. Moving on to Schedule 3, you have other species like barking deer, bharal, chinkara, spotted deer, hog deer, hyena, a mouse deer, etc. Then you have a Schedule 4. And then you also have a Schedule 5, unfortunately, which does not get much protection. And recently, I think due to the demand of farmers, um, I think wild boar, nilgai perhaps, have been moved into this. Some bats have been moved uh, also into Schedule 5. But it's important for us to understand that bats play a very important role in, uh, in dispersal of seeds, of fruits. They, they, like I said, every animal plays a role. And when they eat a fruit, and then they defecate it eventually with um, uh, with the seed inside of it, that's how we get efficient seed dispersal. So in a way, they're doing the role that they were intended for, but by moving them around, then, you know, we unfortunately lose that advantage that nature created for us initially. Moving on to the definition of domestic animals, as I explained before, those are all wild animals, and these are domestic animals, animals that have been domesticated for centuries and have been used by human beings for milk, eggs, you, know, you meat, and other, other products for riding, etc. And uh, also companion animals are listed in this. So dogs, cats, goats, cows, uh, guinea pigs, sheep, cattle, donkeys, and horses. Uh, these are animals that, are, that do not free range or are not found in the wild. Now moving on to the specifics of the Wildlife Protection Act itself. <laughs> Uh, as you can see, it's a very comprehensive piece of legislation that regulates protected areas such as sanctuaries uh, and reserve forests, national parks. It also has a section, H, which looks into zoos, 38H, uh, amongst other protected locations and defines the creation of the central zoo authority and how zoos are to be managed and regulated, etc. And of course, the main role of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 is to help 
the enforcement authorities and the judiciary to curb the illegal trafficking of wildlife uh, and not just live animals, but also their uh, derivative parts or what, what we call uh, products thereof. The act also um, advises formation of various advisory boards. Uh, it lays out clearly who is the state's authorized representative who takes decision. Because one thing this act really makes very clear is that all wild animals belong to the government. No, no human being, no person can have possession or control of an animal unless they have a written permission letter or an ownership certificate issued by the chief wildlife warden of the, that specific state. Uh, and uh, this act, like I mentioned, uh, already has several schedules which you can, you can go through. Uh, referring to protected areas, uh, you know, they are divided into these very specific five areas, sanctuaries, national parks, conservation reserves, community reserves, and tiger reserves. Tiger reserves and national parks, I think, receive the highest level of protection. And then uh, that includes, you know, how much of um, intervention can be done. It even, it's connected with even the Cattle Trespass Act. So technically in national parks and sanctuaries, uh, the local community should not be sending cattle in because cattle, when they come in, they eat grass, but they also leave behind their saliva and the chances of cross contamination between domestic animals and wild animals occurs. That means the because domestic animals are always vaccinated, you know, most farmers vaccinate their poultry, their cattle, etc. But wild animals do not have that kind of protection against bacteria, viruses and other uh, other such things. So there have been many, many instances where diseases like foot and mouth and uh, rinderpest, etc., has gone across from domestic animals into wild animals. And the entire population of wild doles or wild dogs in Bandipur, for example, was decimated um, in the 80s just because of foot and mouth disease. And so cattle, domestic dogs, goats, etc., can cause damages that is why the specific uh, act you know very specifically refers to these points i'm going to go into some of the important sections we will not be able to cover everything but i'm hoping that this will uh, arouse um, enough curiosity for so everyone can explore the books that they have and the act and you can always come back to us for questions and i've also promised uh, Rajiv Gupta, sir, that we'd be more than happy to come there and even have more interactive sessions with our legal counsels as well uh, at a future date, if required. Section 11 uh, refers to hunting of wild animals, and uh, it, it specifically says that hunting can only be, hunting also is defined as collection of animals for research purposes, for educational purposes, and the only a time hunting is permitted is if the chief wildlife warden of a state issues a very clear order defining that and for a specific animal. And uh, the only rare cases when hunting is actually being to destroy an animal, that has been when either a tiger or a leopard has become a man eater or a, an elephant has turned rogue. And there has been you know, 10, 15, 20 elephants that have, I mean, animals, uh, people who have been killed by these animals. And, uh, you know, there have been cases in Maharashtra and in Uttar Pradesh where, uh, you know, man-eating animals have had to be destroyed by the chief wildlife warden. And this is a very extreme step, which I'm sure every chief wildlife warden, you know, differs from doing and he does not want to do it. But unfortunately, he's forced to do it sometimes in the interest of protecting public property and public lives. Section 39, uh, another very important section. Uh, any wild animal that's been hunted or um, collected and even found dead, recovered from poachers, are the property of the government. And that's something that you have to... Uh, uh, th this is really something that needs to be understood. And uh, I think this will help create deterrence as well in the future, which means any animal article trophies, uncured trophies, meat from de uh, dead animals, um, 
becomes government property the minute it is found. So if the wildlife protection department or the forest department confiscates, uh, you know, a product, weapons, uh, and the offender is caught, then under this section, section 39, uh, a vessel, a vehicle, um, you know, uh, weapons, and any traps, snares, etc., that have been found in the possession of the poacher become government property and they get they become seized and there are multiple instances and we don't have time to do too many case studies today but uh, there are ample cases which explain um, these situations including where sandalwood has been seized by karnataka forest department and the entire and a bunch of trucks that were transporting the sandalwood that was illegally felled were all confiscated and uh, seized by the forest department and when I refer to animal articles, I also mean that, you know, uh, one thing, like I mentioned on Saturday, you know, a lot of body parts of animals are harvested from a dead animal, you know, nails, genital organs, eyes, blood, bone, whiskers, tail hair, etc. All of these are taken away, but for, for illegal uh, Chinese medicine or for uh, illegal trafficking, but all of that becomes government property the minute it is detected and, and found. So it cannot be used for selling. It cannot be used for any purpose by the offenders. Section 40, another uh, very important section that I'm referring to. Uh, any individual having in his or her custody a wild animal under Schedule 1 or any part of Schedule 2 shall inform the chief wildlife warden. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an authorized officer in the event the chief wildlife warden delegates his authority sometimes. He has to give the information within 30 days from the commencement of the act. But now, in reality, they have to inform it within 24 hours. Let's say they rescue a, you know, a baby bear or they get a deer and they have it in their custody. They must inform the chief wildlife warden that I've got this animal. I found it in so-and-so place. It's in my custody. And please take the necessary action. Uh, no person shall, after the commencement of this act, acquire, receive, keep in his control, custody, sell, offer for sale, or transfer, transport any animal mentioned under Schedule 1 or Part 2 of Schedule 2, uh, like I mentioned, without written permission from the Chief Wildlife Warden. I think this makes it amply clear. And uh, the ownership certificate I already mentioned earlier, that this is, um, this is very specific, and no person can have lawful possession of an animal and you must have seen you know people with monkeys people with snakes elephants uh, etc in their possession but if they do not have a legal procurement certificate a, an ownership certificate from the chief i lab warden and a uh, transit permit to bring it into that state then it's it's a violation of the law section 50 uh, again here section 50 is um, is a very important section because it provides certain officers under this uh, in under this law power to enter search and even arrest but the procedure is also prescribed under section 100 of crpc 1973 under section 50 uh, subsection 8 of the wildlife protection act only uh, an officer of the rank not lower than the assistant conservator forest or in terms of police it has to be a sub inspector of police those are the only two above those ranks is where they can, uh, you know, take action under these act under under this specific act. Section 51 sets out the penalties, and it of course the penalties vary depending on whether the the offense was committed inside a national park, inside a tiger reserve, or was it in agricultural land, and then whether it involved killing an animal, maiming an animal, uh, or whether people encroached the land. Also, this takes into account if the offender is a repeat offender. In, in such cases, then the penalties vary and are increased. Okay, this is something that uh, will also be uh, interesting, but many of you might already know this. Section 51A actually states clearly that no bail can be given to a person who's been previously committed, uh, convicted of an offense under the Wildlife Protection Act. And in the present and the present instance, he's been held for the same uh, offenses, a repeat offender, basically, Schedule 1, part 2 of Schedule 2, 
and any offenses related to hunting inside boundaries of national parks or wildlife sanctuaries or encroaching from his farmland if his farmland is you know abutting a national park or a sanctuary and he's tried to expand the fence and swallowed up some of the national park or sanctuary land and also this act even uh, clearly states that without the public prosecutor being given an opportunity to explain and oppose bail a uh, bail uh, actually cannot be given um and and uh, there should be adequate opportunity given to oppose bail in in this instance also under section 55 of this act a competent court is allowed to take cognizance of uh, this act only on complaint being filed it does not require an fir or other uh, other issues so this is uh, something that has i mean the act almost makes it um easier for the wildlife protection department or the forest department to take action because what they are trying to protect is as you can imagine unsecured wealth we can't create a vault or a safe to protect the wildlife resources that our country has we cannot protect forests and wild animals by putting them inside a safe or a lock uh, or a fence they are open and they are available so the only way it can work effectively to uh, use these laws and to help protect these animals is by ensuring the implementation of these uh, laws and acts so i'd like to very briefly now uh, draw a few anecdotal references um, locally to jnk itself and uh, here's some action that's been taken by the wildlife protection department uh, and uh, you know i think the regional wildlife warden uh, mr rashid nakash um, will be able to give further details uh, if there is any information that's uh, required uh, from any of you but in the last 3 years alone between 20, 2017 and 2020 a total of 92 weapons boats and traps have been seized by wildlife offenders from wildlife offenders by the wildlife protection department but unfortunately uh, and this is something that i have myself seen and experienced that offenders very often apply and regain custody of their weapons and they then use those weapons again to go and repeat offenses with the same weapons in the same place and uh, so you know one of the things that is really a, you know a need of the hour is that these weapons become government property so as i explained under section 39 and <clears throat> if these weapons are then seized and not returned back to the offenders i think it will work as a very strong deterrent to ensure the protection of the of the wildlife i'm and i'm speaking specifically with reference to jammu and kashmir this is all uh, a re relevant to kashmir specifically here's another uh, uh, anecdotal reference that i'd like to give you uh, in reality as of now just in the last 10 years there have been Uh, over 6000 cases 6190 cases booked uh in wildlife offenses alone this is just kashmir uh the cases that have been disposed of so far in the last 10 years are 27 and the cases that are awaiting trial are uh 6163 and uh, the actual um the actual sheet which uh, which highlights the different cases you know the cases under trial by forest department and then at the court stage and by the police uh, are all clearly laid out here for your reference and this is a a small window into what is going on and how all of you can also you know take an interest in this and help uh, address this issue in real time this is something which is very interesting and i wanted to share it with all of you how do they how do these offenders the poachers manage to shoot thousands of these ducks rare ducks and extremely rare and protected migratory species that come to kashmir hoping to make it their home for a for a few months so what they do is what you see on the left on that table are lined up decoy ducks these are motorized ducks and i understand uh, from rashid nakash sir in my interaction with him that these are motorized and they cost about 40 50000 rupees each and they use those by remote control and have them make they cheat the ducks that are flying overhead to land in that water body by having these ducks floating around so those ducks flying up there 
imagine and think that these are already the these ducks are already in the water so that must be a safe place for us to land and then they descend and land and the next thing they know is they are you know sh they are shot at and uh, you know you can see these weapons also lined up on the same table and these are weapons that were confiscated but unfortunately like i mentioned many of the weapons are released back um, to the offenders and they go back to do exactly uh, what they are not supposed to do so um, I, I took the liberty to add some of the questions from our previous uh, session where many people asked about what can be done, how can we change things, et cetera. So I took the liberty of adding those into the presentation. Um, so one of the things that we uh, have noticed is that you know the chief judicial magistrate in districts, in all districts have been empowered um, to take action. But as you can imagine, the chief judicial magistrate CGM courts are overburdened severely with administrative and judicial duties. And this obviously will cause a delay in disposal of cases. And we do have a huge population. We have a lot of cases in our country, so we need to do that. So I would actually take this opportunity and the liberty, and I hope I'm forgiven for taking this liberty, uh, request an appeal uh, to the Honorable uh, Chief Justice of G Jammu and Kashmir if um, she may kindly consider designating special courts in every district to deal with cases related to wildlife offenses specifically. Uh, yes, Katik, just a quick word, but it will be necessary to know, do a census about how many cases I have every district, you know. I, you know, uh, unless it can be assigned as a special task specifically to the judge. You know, you need to assign the work to a magistrate as well as the district uh, sessions level judge, depending on the punishment with which the offense is punishable. But, uh, you know, we may not have so many prosecutions. We have 22 districts between Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh, 20 in JNK and 2 in Ladakh. But it really depends on how many prosecutions there are, you know. Yes, thank yes. you. I think about it, five or six districts to start with, perhaps. You know, then you we don't list. have that many under the Wildlife Protection Act, but I think more, there are more cases under PCA, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals there. That's because of all of you active people there. You have to activate first, get more people moving. I hope some of the young people who are watching and hearing you will get motivated and take action in Jammu and Kashmir. Then we'll need to... I think designate, but I'll do a census. Rajiv, make a note of this. Huh? Yeah, I think the, the, the main areas are Shopian, uh, I think, sorry, North. Central has the largest number of cases, 3,235 in the what central are the nature division of, of Kashmir. What are the nature of offenses? All wildlife uh, protection. Oh. I will send you this breakdown, uh, madam. Yes. Please do so. Yes. yes, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, um, also to add on to uh, the rest of the presentation, you know, awarding stricter punishments to the offenders, especially re repeat offenders, will certainly help. You know, the, the whole idea of the law is to prevent this kind of crime. And one person getting punishment, you know, the shame associated with it, the message that goes to the community has a very strong ripple effect, you know, to ensure that other people who are planning to go do this will not be encouraged. But if they see that these guys are able to get away, they get their weapons back, it's it's not really, it's a small fine and they escape, then it will unfortunately work as an encouragement for other people to go and continue to do more poaching of wildlife. Also, again, bail, because although the, the act does not prescribe, uh, you know, bail, it actually says these are non-bailable sections and non-compoundable as well. But it is, of course, the discretion of the court. But if the court would be so kind as to uh, look at this in a way and ensure that the strictest possible punishment is awarded under the, that is prescribed under the prescription of the law, of course, then it would ensure that you know the, the wildlife protection department would feel more encouraged and they would then ensure that you know these people uh, are followed and the law is implemented of course uh, uh, there is a need to create more awareness and we 
will assist uh, Jammu and Kashmir Wildlife Protection Department in every way possible to help um, spread that awareness from our side as well. The one other important aspect, and this is applicable not just in GNK but across India, is that currently courts recognize only Central Forensic Sciences Laboratory um, and one in Bhopal, one in the Wildlife Institute of India, and then one, I think, in Bangalore. But these institutes are so severely overburdened. They have, uh, you know, samples that have been received from across India and piled up, you know, to the ceiling in many places that they find it really difficult to submit the results of these forensic, um, you know, analysis in time. And that further delays the disposal of these matters in court. So there may be a need in the future to consider certifying or recognizing certain private labs that can also expedite forensic evidence, which will help disposal of cases in a, in a speedier manner. So now we move on from the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 to the PCA Act 1960. And uh, this act was primarily you know, formulated to prevent um, abuse and suffering of animals and unintentional um, you know, suffering that is uh, caused to animals. And the, the vision, of course, was to create a deterrence. It was not to punish people, but to deter people from going about doing this. And there was also an Animal Welfare Board of India that was established under this act, which helps prescribe. In fact, if you watch any movie, uh, you will see a, a statement in the beginning that no animals were harmed during the making of this film. Every single movie that's produced in India has that or is aired in India has that. And that's something that was created by the Animal Welfare Board of India. It also defines that domestic animals and wild animals that are kept in captivity are also covered uh, under this. Now, substantial, uh, this is something I, I wanted to bring up. And, you know, this has been substantial research in the past. And uh, most of you probably already know this, that a lot of convicted, and I'm using some research from the uh, correctional centers in the U.S., where they've got uh, research which shows that convicted criminals, you know, of offenses such as, you know, serial killers, murderers, rapists, etc., they've had a history of animal abuse to start with. You know, they've skinned a cat or beaten a dog or burnt, you know, a bird or something like that. And then they've moved to child abuse, and then they've gone to gorier crimes, uh, like kidnapping and ransom and, you know, murder and stuff like that. So, in a way, I think, you know, the, the act of correcting animal abuse at the right, at the initial stage, will help create a, a better society as well, you know, in the future, because these people then have a chance of correcting themselves and getting on the right track, rather than uh, that those bad habits going uncorrected. This act also specifically discusses different forms of cruelty, what exceptions are there, and even if an animal is being, you know, killed for or butchered, it actually has prescription on what kind of humane methods need to be used uh, versus inhumane and cruel methods that could be used. It even provides guidelines about abattoirs, butcheries, uh, and experimentation of animals for research purposes, because a lot of pharmaceutical drugs are made uh, and they are approved as per the law. They are approved only when they have been tested on animals. And that means uh, rabbits, monkeys, frogs, uh, birds, and you know other animals are used, uh, including chimpanzees, etc., are used in labs. And they test, you know, for example, a shampoo will be tested by dropping it in the IU. They, would you know clip the eyelids open and then they would drop the uh, shampoo or the other liquid into the eye to test it. This is just an example. I'm giving you a random example, but there are multiple things that form uh, you know form quite a bit of cruelty in some cases, and uh, so for that they have set up committees for that. It also um, definitely enshrines provisions related to the exhibition of performing animals like in circuses, etc. I was mentioning about the Animal Welfare Board. The main functions of the board is, of course, you know, to supervise the laws, uh, intervene where required, and take steps uh, wherever uh, required. It also provides an advisory stage. Earlier, the Animal Welfare Board of India was functioning under the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Today, it's moved to the 
um, agriculture ministry. So section 13, 11 to 13 of this act uh, specifically deals with cruelty and the action which um, you know, are defined as cruelty towards animals. And it could include kicking, beating, shooting, dehorning of cattle, overriding, uh, uh, overloading, uh, and causing a lot of unnecessary pain. It even defines uh, the amount of space, you know, uh, that is required inside a truck when people are transporting cattle, for example. You know, if a truck has a certain amount of space, I won't go into the specifics right now, but if you go through it, it's a very small and a slim act. You can easily review it. There are guidelines as well. So instead of placing 10 animals in a truck, you know, very often transporters to profiteer from, um, you know, making more money uh, from the transport of animals, they will pack about three times as, as much as capacity that the truck will allow. So you can imagine uh, very often buffaloes will be tied with their nostrils and the rope going through that and they'll be choking. There'll be a one animal's horn would have entered the other animal's jugular. They'll arrive dead. There'll be two layers of animals for goats, for example, goats and sheep. They put them one on top of the other, chicken as well. So that's where this act specifically refers to. It also prescribes punishment when a person takes part in, in things like that, you know, in, 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 in uh, crimes related to animal cruelty. But this is the, the um, not so good part of the act, which refers to the punishments being very, very uh, small, you know, 50 rupees and 500 rupees and 25 rupees and 100 rupees and things like that. But this is where I think, you know, some courts could possibly, the honorable court could uh, possibly take a discretionary view of the act and uh, where it does allow um, you know, imprisonment for maybe up to three months in some cases. So if the maximum punishment is awarded to an offender, then, you know, people will not go away saying, you know, I've just paid 50 rupees, 50 rupees, my problem solved, no matter what, we'll do it again, we'll do it again. So that kind of an attitude can be changed and awareness can be built and deterrence can be, uh, you know, ensured in society if, um, if the stricter the maximum punishment is awarded in such cases. Also, um, you know, the quality of animals, uh, the quality of life for voiceless animals needs to be considered with sympathy and kindness. For example, even in, in a butchery where people, uh, you know, where animals or birds are being slaughtered, you know, there are prescriptions that one animal does not see or hear or smell the fear of the other animal. Not only is it is it bad for animal welfare, it's inhumane, but it also creates a lot of chemical reactions inside the body of that animal. And an animal that is watching another animal dragged to its death and hacked or, you know, bleeding to its death creates a huge amount of, uh, you know, chemical imbalance in its body. And that means the meat gets poisoned. And the people who eat it, of course, don't realize it, but it's creating toxins inside their body. Section 14 to 20 of the Act, again, deals with experiments. Um, 14 actually bans any kind of animal testing. At the moment, uh, only very specific tests are permitted. And there is even a committee called the CPCSEA that has been uh, put in place for addressing this. And then Section 18 grants powers to inspect and search premises. So here is where, you know, people who have done overcrowding, holding of animals, uh, and, you know, people who are just, like, for example, you know, we, uh, we've we seen cases where a person has tied his dog up, he's got three big aggressive dogs, he keeps them tied up in his roof all day long, um, and, you know, they are dehydrating, they don't have any place, and then he beats them because he's not able to look after them. So in such cases, then the authorities will have the powers to search uh, these premises, inspect them, and then create correctional uh, mechanisms in here to make sure that that is uh, done. This also applies to experimentation where they can go in and check if certain laboratories uh, procure uh, animals illegally. So they may have a permit for only 30 rabbits and 20 monkeys, but they may have 500 monkeys in reality. So this is where they need to go in and, and actually check what is going on in that uh, case. 
again, I'd like to just say that the breach of the section is only a fine of 200 rupees. So again, you know, this is not unfortunately working uh, as a strong deterrent. So that, that I hope will change in the future. We now move to the animals used for performances, like in circuses or in films, or, you know, there used to be a, a, uh, a practice where earlier people, when they have birthdays of their children, they would call a man with a monkey, a madari with a monkey or a bear or an elephant, and then organize rides for their kids and things like that. But all of those involve a certain amount of uh, animal abuse and cruelty. And wild animals cannot be used for performances. As uh, the Honorable Chief Justice even mentioned earlier, there was a case <clears throat> about it. And uh, in fact, she was involved in that case. And uh, as of now, uh, there are these five species, uh, bears, monkeys, leopards, tigers, and um, uh, lions that are not permitted to be kept in, in circuses. When, and most circuses have actually changed. They have realized that people watch Animal Planet and Discovery on TV, and they are not going to be uh, fascinated by uh, watching these animals in a circus. So people go to watch human acrobats much more. So again, uh, I think this, this is um, a repetition. And it also just goes to say that it refers to Section 23 about the judicial power to restrict training of animals. But I think I can leave this. We are running out of time. It's already 5 o'clock. I don't want to run over time. So you can see, again, here it says clearly that a person found guilty uh, of training an animal without permission, which is not registered, then can be fined 500 rupees or with imprisonment up to three months or both. And this is where, you know, it would be up to the courts, honorable courts discretionary power to maybe do both, which would help create a, a strong deterrence in the future. Killing of animals under religious purposes is also uh, prohibited under this act. And uh, again, this is, this is quite clear. You can, you can read that. that. That refers to primarily, you know, sacrifice and things like that when, a lot of tribal communities, they sacrifice animals. They also sacrifice human children. But that is what that refers to primarily. Now, this is something that also addresses some questions that I got on uh, Saturday about dogs in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, I saw that uh, there was a question where people said that dogs in Jammu and Kashmir are becoming feral, they bite people, they attack us. How do we protect ourselves? Is there a way to humanely address this issue? This is the answer to that question. Animal birth control mechanism that is actually prescribed under the law. Uh, and we also have stray dog management rules 2001 and the animal birth control rules 2001, which, may, which actually recommends that any stray dog that is found in any place, including Jammu and Kashmir, must be vaccinated to make it safe for public so that a vaccinated dog becomes a, a very safe dog. Because dogs, what do dogs do? Dogs perform the role in your area because they are territorial animals, they take up residence and they, they live around human habitation because humans feed them or they find food in the trash that humans create. And dogs receive, sorry, am I running out of time? No, no, Kartik, I wanted to intervene here. I just want to tell you what I learned on the bench regarding uh, attempts to or vaccinate strays. You know, I was told that they all move in groups and they're very territorial. So, you know, dogs have a territory and they don't even let other stray dogs into that territory. And uh, if we note that you see the same dog in the same colony or the same area at all points of time, and in order to vaccinate them or to sterilize them, you have to take the dog to the facility, the sterilizing facility or the veterinary facility. And you sterilize the dog and you uh, vac or you vaccinate it. There's been a human interface and in human intervention. And uh, they will be, and you when you put them back into their territory, they say they become even more ferocious. You know, same problem about monkeys. If you make the effort to sterilize them, you have to remove them from the herd unless you take the whole herd together. Monkeys move in herds. And uh, they say that uh, they, the monkey will be abandoned because by the time you put him back, the rest of the herd would have moved away. And uh, because you, he, the monkey has seen human handling, he may be more dangerous after the handling and after the sterilization or the vaccination than before. You are the expert. 
you know this is where you came in in the pil before me also yes yes thank you for bringing that up may i respond please yes yes please go ahead thank you thank you uh, yes with regard to dogs you know there is an organization in delhi that's called frendico sikh i'm in fact an executive member on that and uh, frendicos has been involved in stray dog sterilizations and vaccination since 1986 and my understanding because i've been involved in some of these operations as well my understanding uh, in the field is that yes dogs are very territorial they can form packs when a female uh, dog or a bitch is on heat then they form packs and they follow her around and that's when they become most aggressive but uh and the idea is for them to procreate and reproduce but if male dogs are sterilized and female dogs are spayed or neutered and the males are you know uh, of course castrated then what happens is the testosterone levels and the hormonal changes in the body um stop so it makes a dog you know much uh, mu a lot less aggressive and uh, and more balanced when it's around human beings and we've seen that in umpteen cases since 1986 that you know uh, animals do not i mean these dogs dogs specifically uh, the chances of them creating these packs going around getting aggressive etc reduces dramatically and we could try a pilot in jammu and kashmir we did try to establish something like that and we'd be more than happy to try it again um if if the um, honorable court would so um suggest we'd be more than happy to intervene and and provide any support at all but yes these dogs need to be captured uh, but when they are captured you see where the dog is from and you take a gps location and then that dog is brought back to that exact same place because we tattoo the number on the ear or the lip and then uh, there's a number on it it also has a tag with a number so the chance of that dog being released somewhere else is not there the dog is taken to the sterilization center it's vaccinated so it becomes safe it's sterilized so it becomes even safer and then is brought back and released there uh, that's that's the way the animal birth control program works and we can we can try that it has worked very well in delhi udaipur jaipur etc there are um, amounting places where it's worked quite well uh, and uh, we can easily emulate this plan but you can protect people from rabies you can also protect um, you know an ex uh, an exponential growth in uh, stray dogs because a dog can produce i mean if you have a dog and a bitch you i mean you would have hundreds of puppies in a matter of 5 years and so you can imagine each of them becomes capable of reproducing at 11 months so you you know you can you can imagine the number of dogs you would have if you do not have a stray dog sterilization and a vaccination program this is my understanding and i'm i'm more than happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation about this um i'm going back to the punishments under pca uh, like i said the punishments are not a strong deterrent so offenders are not uh, discouraged uh, and uh, in in one case it is 3 years um, and in another case it's 3 months so um, we will have to uh, you know leave it to the discretion of the honorable court to take a kinder view and a stricter view to create uh, to award maximum punishment to create deterrence in this particular case so uh, uh, again you know if if the honorable courts in are this looking at whether it's the wildlife protection act or it's the uh, prevention of cruelty to animals act if they do not take a lenient view of offenses and award maximum punishment as prescribed under the act then it will create a uh, help to create strong deterrence and protect wildlife forests as well as animals locally and uh, and of course uh, section 429 of the ipc also prescribes 5 years punishment for killing or maiming of certain animals and again this is something you can all refer to but this is a cognizable but available offense and uh, now i'd like to refer to some specific notes we are almost at the end of the presentation and we can move to the q and a just some specific notes on the jnk situation in kashmir region alone like i mentioned earlier more than uh, 5000 i think it's over 6000 offenses and uh, there's not even a, a one one um, you know sentence 
uh, and no serious conviction yet. Most offenders are able to get acquitted with just a minimal penal penalty amount, which only emboldens them further to violate the law with more, you know, blatantly. And hunting of uh, Schedule 4 birds or migratory waterfowl during winter season poses a serious threat to the survival of these very, very endangered species that receive protection. And India is a signatory of the United Nations Convention on Migratory Species. And despite that, you know, it, make, it makes it obligatory for, for India to ensure that these birds who are our winged visitors come all the way to our country and they receive full protection. But sadly, they do not, you know, uh, and local poachers using licensed and unlicensed weapons, uh, you know, rampantly shoot these birds. And the offenders are encouraged to repeat their offenses because they are able to get back their traps, their tools, their vehicles, their boats and their guns back to them very quickly. And unfortunately, these people go back to repeat those offenses in the very same places with those very same weapons. So uh, I'd like to just point out that hunting tools and weapons, like I mentioned earlier, under Section 39, uh, can be confiscated as they are government property and not released back to offenders. If they uh, if if needed, they can be kept on superb nama with the forest department, the wildlife protection department, till the trial is over. The forest magistrate appointed for looking after offenses under the Forest Act and Wildlife Act is currently only in Srinagar. And if if possibly some arrangements like the Honorable Chief Justice very kindly mentioned, if it's possible to explore the possibility of doing this in other districts, it would facilitate quicker disposal of these cases and a stronger protection in the state. Thank you. And that ends brings us to the end of my presentation. And we are more than happy to go into a question answer sessions. So thank you very much. It was a really enlightening presentation from you. Uh, many of the questions you already have addressed. So if there are uh, some questions, Shirina can uh, coordinate. Yes, Shirina, you can coordinate, uh, moderate these questions. If you could see these questions in Q&A and chat box. Uh, thank you, sir. I yes, think we have already answered uh, all the questions that have come today. Most of them are um, positive feedback from everyone. So thank you a lot. Uh, there was one question that I got on a, a private chat, which said uh, by, by Devaksh, which said, COVID tests are being done on animals before humans. Are those valid? Okay, that, that requires very specialized veterinary uh, response. But, you know, there's only been one case where one tiger in New York, uh, I think Central Park Zoo or something tested, um, you know, uh, they, they I think tested positive. They weren't sure, but they suspected that the keeper had, you know, handled it or something like that. But uh, I'm not really sure if, uh, if it's relevant to the topic today. However, uh, perhaps we can get back to that person with, uh, uh, you know, with, with a specialized answer after discussing it with our veterinary doctors. Right. Uh, there was another question on Saturday, which we hadn't covered. It was by Sarabjit Kaur. Uh, it said that um, a lot of the time poachers are not keen on accepting alternate livelihood methods. How do you cope with such situations? So to this, I would uh, uh, respond by saying that, you know, as human beings, we have evolved. You know, my forefathers did not wear clothes. They didn't have a watch. They walked barefoot uh, and they didn't have computers or webinars. They were, you know, uh, they were people of the Stone Age and they were, you know, digging tubers from the forest, perhaps. But we have all evolved. And that's the way that, you know, the country needs to evolve, too. I mean, we, we don't follow, we don't have dinosaurs anymore, so we've got to evolve along with that. And if the law in our country prescribes protection of certain things, if, you know, killing a person is, is a violation of the law, killing an animal is a violation of the law, then the law needs to be followed. And that is why we have laws in a country to maintain discipline in society. So, yes, um, a lot of communities or people who are habitual poachers, um, you know, if it's for the pot and if it's to feed their families, they always will accept. Usually, from our experience of the last 30 years, I can say that we dealt with 3,000 families who were using 
bears that were poached from the wild for their livelihoods. And when we went to them and they said, this is all we know. We don't know any other way of looking after our families. This, and then we worked with them. We did a needs assessment and found out that every man and every family has a dream. They wanted electricity. They wanted toilets. They wanted drinking water. And they couldn't get it. They didn't have education. They didn't send their children to school. So when we started by helping them with positive inter intervention, we helped them send their children to school. We sent over 7,600 children to school, like I said in the presentation on Saturday. Um, we also helped empower the women so they could become second income earners in the community. And we helped them find alternative jobs, alternative forms of livelihood, which would get them a better revenue and it would keep them out of jail. I mean, what is more important than, than that, you know, if they can form, follow a legal form of livelihood that will not take them to jail, they can stay with their families and hold their head up in dignity. I think that is certainly an option that can be offered. And that is why laws exist. If people will not accept it, then that's where the carrot and stick approach. So that is the carrot that you have a legal opportunity. You can hold your head up with dignity. You can have a good way of life. Your children can go to school. You can look after yourself. You don't have to be shamed in society. And the stick is the law. So the law will probably have to be used in, in such cases. And that's where the focus of deterrence is so important. If we can deter people from violation by making an example of even just a few people. And I can tell you that when we were helping this community with their dancing bears, yes, there were some poachers who would still go and repeatedly bring sloth bears or bear cubs from the forest. But what did we do? We spoke with the forest officers. Forest officers took very stringent action and they all got convicted for three, four, five years. One man's conviction uh, made it a, a, you know, a, a strong ripple, a rippling effect across several villages. So maybe, maybe 2,000 families got the message from one man's arrest. Of course, we, when he eventually came out, we helped them, we helped the family and all of that. But it really, sometimes you need, you know, some amount of collateral impact, which will help protect the larger good, you know, for the larger good of society, for the larger good of the country. Uh, there is a need to ensure that laws are implemented. Otherwise, there'll be mayhem, you know, there'll be riots, people will loot everything, people will swindle, cheat, uh, and, and uh, you know, there'll be decoity. Uh, across across if we didn't have laws so I, I hope that answers the question thank you sir one question has just come up by arshia she's asking sir what about mink fur which is being used for making eyelashes so what is the legal status for that you know i'll need to look i don't think minks are uh, is this an internet if this is an international example we've got to also understand that some countries do permit such exploitation of animals, and China is one such country. Can you believe it? There are 16,000 tigers in 400 tiger farms in China, where they breed them, slaughter them, fill the, put the carcass into a, uh, into a wad of wine or a barrel of wine, and sell the tiger wine in airports. You can fly into Chinese airports and buy tiger wine over there. So it's fully legal. And mink farms, again, I think it may be illegal. It's possibly legal. In, it depends on which country you're referring to to make these eyelashes. And uh, we, we can certainly look into it and, and get back with a more specific answer. But an, a local um, anecdote which matches that is the mongoose hairbrush. Do you know every artist who uses um, brushes to paint was until recently using mongoose hairbrush. So the mongoose would be bludgeoned and then their hair would be pulled off. And that is what was creating the hairbrushes. And there have been multiple seizures done by forest departments and police and wildlife crime control bureau across the country to curb this. But sometimes it still goes on illegally. Most uh, art shops or stationery shops will know this. The minute you go there and ask them, I would like a paintbrush, they'll mostly offer you only a synthetic one made with horse hair or possibly plastic. But if you ask them about mongoose hairbrush, if they are an ethical shop and are following the law, then they will not. Um, uh, they will not recommend or offer you mongoose hairbrush. I hope Thank that answers you. the question. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, I think we have covered all of the other questions that came on Saturday as well. If anyone else has questions, um, I will just check the Q and A box. Okay. Uh, one question. by Mr. Ubaid Mir. I'm checking the Q and A. Oh yes, that's exactly what I'm reading. So, what are your views about governments and authorities acting in the interest of private firms whose entire profits depend on pillaged uh, natural resources that de destroy the animal habitats of animals? Again, you know, this is a violation of the Wildlife Protection Act, and if we are able to, um, you know, follow the law, that's why implementation of laws to the strictest degree will help deter such uh, incidences. You are talking about, you know, private firms trying to profit here from pillaging natural resources and destroying habitats of animals. Yes, that won't happen if the laws are implemented. You know, that just cannot happen. And that's why I think, you know, uh, it's such an honor to be able to speak to all of you because you are the law. You can change things. And I hope that this interaction will result in, um, you know, in, in some changes immediately to JNK and then across India as well. Thank you. Uh, there's also one question by WhatsApp uh, Sharma asking about um, how, who do we call um, when we need an animal to, that needs rescuing? Because people are unaware when a an, wild animal comes into their area. I think the immediate, per, uh, immediate contact is of the regional wildlife warden. They must contact the regional wildlife warden immediately of that area, whichever relevant area it is. And these numbers can easily be uh, available. And we can also, certainly for Jammu and Kashmir, we can get a list put together and, and send it back um, to uh, Rajiv Gutta, sir, who can then circulate it to all the attendees. Thank you. I think, I think not only for JNK, but for but for the whole country, for all the states. Certainly, we'll put together. We, it might take us a few days to just compile that list, but we we'll yes, yes, it. don't. Uh, that's all right. We'll post it because we have interns from all over the country. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so I think we've gone through all the questions now. If anyone has any uh, more questions, you can write your email address <coughs> with the question, and we can email you the answers. After that, I think our time is up now. Rajiv, sir, back to you. Uh, yes, Shirina, there are two questions. One, it, one is in chat box. It is from uh, one uh, Sanjay. Uh, Section 51A enacts bar in grant of bail in case of repeated offenses. Can we have a data of such cases and whether the courts do make use of such provision? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would love to get this data compiled and send it to you and have a, a more detailed discussion. And if the opportunity presents itself, uh, I would invite all of you to either come to our centers in Agra, Mathura or Delhi uh, to interact with us and actually be in the field around animals uh, to uh, experience it fully. Uh, or we would be more than happy to come to JNK once travel gets normalized. Uh, and and participate and share all of this with you. In the meantime, we will put together a uh, you know some relevant data and send it to you, uh, so you can you can look at it. Thank you for bringing that to our notice. Uh, just this is last question. This has come in my WhatsApp. Uh, name is not written, but uh, uh, the question is very pertinent. It says that uh, uh, the prosecution wing of the wildlife department is very weak. They don't present themselves in court uh, for prosecution of their cases. So that is one of the reasons that uh, the cases go uncontested and in default. So what is what can be done with that part? Uh, certainly, we can, we can certainly uh, speak with the Wildlife Protection Department and request them to strengthen their prosecution. In many cases, uh, you know, we have a we have a small team that goes to assist uh, prosecution efforts. Uh, for forest departments, but uh, I think this is certainly a, a very valid point and we will speak with the regional wildlife wardens uh, to see how they can build capacity. So they can have stronger prosecution representatives to represent them their matter in court. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, uh, you had uh, referred to the forest court being the uh, only court. Actually, that court uh, is provincial court. 
it trip uh, it it gets cases from whole of kashmir <laughs> province so just uh, one addition to what you right. have well, thank you so much thank you for pointing that out sir uh, thank you very much uh, i think we have covered all the questions so still if there are questions uh, from attendees <clears throat> they can post these questions in to me or uh, to both of you these questions can also be taken up uh, uh, and uh, can be answered Uh, individually to these participants so thank you all uh, just to tell all the participants that we have already been joined by honorable miss justice sindhu sharma uh, immediately after uh, start of our program she had joined so last time also we had requested uh, ma'am to join uh, to say few words uh, yes yes ma'am you are there can you hear me please Yes, ma'am. Good evening. We can hear you, ma'am. Please. Uh, and good evening. I think Chief Ma'am is also there, Mr. Karthik Satyanarayan. It's indeed been an eye opener. Your presentation on Saturday and today also was so riveting. It was difficult to stay away from it. With so many of the things, with our Chief Ma'am, she has the experience on being on the bench and listening to a lot of PILs in these matters. but with lot of these things like the dogs street dogs how to look after them the sos the basic problem we start fumbling is when we find a wild animal as simple as a snail at a backyard where to look for it not only that the protection part the monkeys which have now becoming a menace here so all these things i feel um, from a society which learned to fear the animals rever them worship them we are now torturing and targeting them to a large extent maybe not consciously but unconsciously we are doing that so very important is to all these things should be added in our school culture co curricular activities also sensitization and awareness which you have very rightly pointed out but it was indeed an eye opener in many of the aspects which we did not know so hopefully we'll learn more from you and we'll be able to visit your centers Once thank you again. very much for your kind words i really appreciate that thank you i must thank our chief ma'am for such a wonderful and uh, important topic which is so relevant in today's time to look it up thank and you thank you for all the panelists and for us as well because we keep need there's a need to educate us as every day on these topics i think we sometimes in our daily grind we are left behind in certain so we need expert opinions on such cases thank you rajiv thank you so much thank you very much ma'am thank you very much now may i request honorable the chief justice to say the final words ma'am please oh no rajiv the last word is always yours but uh, thank you very much kartik shrida and uh, i hopefully we'll see you again soon presentation you caps encapsulated it very very well and it was good for me also you know to get go through the refresher you know i'd forgotten many of the provisions so nice to see you sindhu you know we have the all the we managed to we are trying to get very good panelists and i hope you'll stay with us please encourage some of our other brothers also to join you know you won't get this chance again we've got some very good experts we've done animals with kartik and we'll be doing the forest part now you know one session on on the third and uh, all the other we are trying to bring in i'm even trying to bring in experts where careers in law in criminal law are concerned we're getting the best in the country siddharth lutra rebecca menon and uh, you know bharat chog will be talking on corporate criminal liability a very new subject so all these are legal issues what kartik has also spoken about will come before you as a case and to my young friends who have been here my uh, friend uh, my friends students from all over the country and our judges uh, i hope you found this useful we are looking forward to your inputs to improve on the programs that we are doing you know we've tried to structure it but we are not able to you know structure the subjects much because our scheduling is depending on the availability of the uh, resource persons so we are looking at everything right from the uh, umbrella of the constitution of india to 
you know, basic civil and criminal legal issues and also to help you give you an idea of the different areas of law practices which will help you in making taking making personal choices so thank you very much again kartik and uh, good luck with your work keep on with the good work it was interesting to see decoy ducks i didn't know what it what what uh, that this is what was happening and even ducks were being poached we uh, the the migrant ducks are beautiful the dal lake is absolutely spectacular you know it's dotted with these birds that they come in thousands and thousands in the winter months so uh, thanks th thank you and we'll certainly trouble you again rajiv maybe we can do the legal issue with the Ju judicial academy as well you know you may note kartik's details and stay in touch with him and we'll we are certainly going to look to you for your expertise a very good evening to all of you thank you so much uh, thank you very much ma'am <clears throat> yes it is uh, indeed the efforts of honorable the chief justice that uh, we are able to put together these uh, programs at very pertinent uh, programs and uh, for interns and large searchers uh, these are going to add to their awareness and knowledge so we'll be as already told by honorable the chief justice that we'll be having these series of programs uh, in future so keep joining our programs all the researchers and uh, line turns so thank you ma'am thank you ma'am sindhu sharma ji uh, thank you very much uh, kartik satyanarayan our resource person ably you have uh, dealt these programs in two sessions yes of course we'll be looking to you looking forward for uh, having these programs at your place and uh, in academy premises uh, situation normalizing of course so thank you very much thank you shirina for uh, uh, putting the things together thank you very much and uh, thank you all the participants which include our uh, judicial officers law researchers law assist assistants and uh, law interns so thank you very much with this we come to the close of uh, this today's session hope to see you very soon for another en enlightening session on uh, another enlightening subject thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you.